I want to give just a little bit of history of this symposium and why uh, we feel like it's a great thing. Hopefully, by the end of the day, you'll feel it's a great thing, too. But if we go back uh, 16 years now, uh, Mr. Graham uh, had some discussions with us about what he perceived to be, and it's not just him, but others in our profession perceived to be a degradation in the collegiality of the profession. The profession, not the job, the profession of being a lawyer. And as is his nature, he didn't just sit idly by and say, well, let's watch this continue to degrade. He was inspired to begin this program, which uh, by the end of today will have reached its uh, 1600 newer Missouri attorney. And the purpose of this is to cultivate and reinvigorate and hopefully through a mentoring process, pass on some of the collegiality that, uh, that the profession of law has been known for for a really long time. And hopefully this pushes that collegiality forward. I want to argue with a few facts. Uh, our Missouri state court system, our Missouri state court system over the last 12 months has concluded 704,000 cases. There's 33,533 licensed Missouri lawyers. And our court system, state court, this is the federal system, state court, has concluded over 704,000 cases in the last 12 months. So why do I bring that up? I can give you some other examples. St. Louis County, where uh, uh, this campus straddles the city and county. The St. Louis County concluded 84,000 of those. The city's numbers are similar. The point I'm getting at here is there is a high volume of cases that are being handled really effectively, and you are a key part of how all of those cases are handled. The attitude that you bring to your advocacy, the demeanor that you display, affects our branch of government. When we say our branch of government, you probably think, gosh, he's talking about it's our branch of government because we're the lawyers. But that's not what I mean. It's our branch of government. Just think about how it works. We have 90,000 Missourians last year that reported for jury duty. We have all of these cases turning. If 704,000 cases are turning, you got a couple of people or more on each side. That's touching a million and a half Missouri citizens and corporations. You've got all of our citizens who are entitled to vote that are voting in our retention elections tomorrow. Uh, this branch of government, the judiciary, that we're all now sworn officers to, touches more citizens more often than any, of any other branch of government. And that's why it's our branch of government. So today, what we're hoping to do and what we're hoping to accomplish is to uh, invigorate you about the coming long years of successful practice that you have, hopefully pass along some helpful hints, tips, suggestions, and pointers to help your career be more fulfilling to you, help you better serve your clients, and help you better represent our branch of government. And one of the people who is very, very good at that is our next speaker, Tom Neal, who is going to speak to you about motion practice. And uh, he knows the details of motion practice. So listen close and let's give a welcome to Tom Neal. And thanks everybody for being here nice and early and uh, helping to make the 16th Annual Symposium off to a good start. So the topic that we're going to lead off with is practical considerations for motion practice. There we go. And, uh, you know, like a lot of you uh, who are on the younger side and who are maybe at the bottom of the totem pole, uh, it's, uh, it's one of the more fun things I think that as younger lawyers you get to do where, you know, quite regularly uh, it might be researching or drafting the stuff that kind of keeps you in the office. When you do get the opportunity to go out in the field, so to speak, and, and get in there in the courtroom, uh, a lot of fun can be had by you and, and a lot of good for your clients. So what do you do when that happens? Well, there's, there's two things. 
that you need to think about. One, just the logistics of preparing the motion. Uh, and we're going to talk extensively about that. And then the second part is really the arguing of the motion. And we'll talk about that aspect as well. Uh, just by show of hands, who here has uh, had the opportunity to get out and argue some motions on, on their own already? I'm, I'm sure probably quite a few of you. Okay, so it looks like more than half. So great. Um, well, let's start with the logistics. And the first place you want to go is quite clearly to the rules. And if you look in the handout, some of these uh, I've, I've printed for you, uh, whether it's out of the very rules of civil procedure or the local rules, which we'll also uh, really try to dig into. But uh, you, you can't go into court and expect to win motions, at least with any regularity, if you don't actually know the rules. Maybe you can kind of fumble your way through it and get lucky once or twice. But we start out with when do you actually have to have a, a written motion and what does it have to contain? And of course, uh, you know, a lot of motions don't have to be much. If it's a motion to compel, you can simply just put down, here was the discovery, they didn't answer it, it's been more than that amount of time, and file the motion. Pursuant to some local rules, we'll talk about something else that needs to be in those, uh, which you're probably already uh, uh, thinking about, and that's uh, some good faith attempts to resolve it. Read Rule 5526. It'll explain that you do have to have a written motion. It can sometimes be written in conjunction with the notice of the hearing, so you can pop it all into one and get it accomplished. But uh, you can't just expect to call the other side, say we're going to be here on such and such a day, show up and the judge uh, always allow you to do that. A lot of times you can, uh, but if it's going to be contentious, if it's going to be a case where you and the other side are maybe not getting along too well on it, uh, if it's a case where the judge, and hopefully over time you'll know your judges, uh, that's not always going to fly. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Even the other day, uh, I had one where we had to get something heard the next day. We all did it by, by agreement. Uh, and the court still said, I gotta have something written in the file before I'll put the order out. So that's fine, and, and we did it that way. But that's your first rule that you need to know. The second, again, uh, particularly on, on most motions where you are going to um, want to do some, some real briefing on it, you're gonna want to make sure everybody is, is complying with the rules, you gotta know what your time limits are. And if it's a written motion, uh, the rules require that, that you put that out there five days uh, in advance. Uh, again, the local rules might tweak that in some uh, venues, so you gotta be on top of it. But at least five days before. Certainly no problem doing that now with the, the e-filing, uh, where there's, there's just no question that somebody's gonna get that notice and you're gonna put that out there in time. So know that rule as well. Um, for those of you that get the opportunity to practice somewhat far afield and might be out in uh, western Missouri, southern Missouri, uh, what have you, there, there is the opportunity to uh, appear by telephone. I would try to avoid it if possible, at least for your first appearance. You'll want to try to see the judge, see the other side. But if it's a rather perfunctory motion, there's certainly nothing wrong with contacting the clerk and asking, pursuant to Rule 5530, can we have this heard by phone? Does the judge need me to be out there uh, for simply uh, uh, getting a, an alias summons issue, for example? And, and certainly they'll, they'll be reasonable. Uh, but that is an option, so don't forget to have that one in your back pocket. Although, I should go back. It does. It is quite clear the court may hear it by phone. They, they certainly don't have to, so don't try to tell the judge that uh, that's the way you're going to do it. Um, now, here's where you do need to make sure you know where you're, you're going to be having this motion heard. Um, you got to know the local rules. A lot of circuits don't have much on, on this, but the bigger ones certainly do. Uh, we're going to focus on the city and the county. That's, uh, that's where probably most of us are, are practicing these days, and they certainly are ones that have quite voluminous local rules. So the time difference. Um, in St. Louis County, we, we just talked about this, the, the, the rule says five days on, on a motion in the, in the very rules of procedure. St. Louis County actually enlarges that and says, no, nope, you got to actually have it to the other side seven days in advance. Uh, and if you are going to file a response, you have to, you can't show up and sandbag the other side that day. You have to at least get it to them a day before the hearing. 
uh, if you're going to file anything in writing. So those are a couple rules that you need to be uh, armed with. And really what that ends up meaning is if you get to the hearing and the other side uh, provided the motion to you less than seven days before, the judge will almost necessarily say, okay, well, I'm not going to rule at the hearing. I'll give the defense or the, uh, the respondent, I should say, the opportunity to file a, a brief after they've had the full seven days. Uh, so all it really does is ends up hurting you because you've now, you've noticed up your motion, uh, you've got the date to file your, your written motion less than seven days before, and essentially you're, you're, you're not blowing your own date. So that's no good. Uh, okay, proposed orders. Again, not in the rule of civil procedure, but in St. Louis County, you file a motion for summary judgment, uh, you have to file a proposed order with it. Probably one of the most overlooked rules that, that we'll talk about today, because I think it's uh, entirely common to receive motions for summary judgment that don't have proposed orders. And quite frankly, the order could be one sentence. You know, <laughs> motion granted. I mean, that's, that's really what you want. If the court wants you to put in the facts, you certainly can. And, uh, and in fact, that will certainly uh, you know, improve the chances of, of holding up on appeal if you're writing your own order, because you know exactly what you want it to say. Uh, but at least have the one sentence one in there to comply with the, the local rule. Here was the other part that uh, I alluded to earlier. But you have to have your, your written motion on a motion to compel or, or a motion to overrule uh, discovery objections or, or what have you. Um, doesn't say anything in the Missouri rules about a good faith attempt to resolve, but the local rules in, in both city and the county require that, that you do uh, have some sort of certification. And I would suspect that uh, even if you aren't familiar with the local rules of Scott County, uh, for example, it's probably a good idea to throw that in as a paragraph that does say, and by the way, I sent them an email 20 days ago asking them to, uh, to give me a call so we could hash this out and they never called. Just put it in there to be on the same side because chances are it's going to be in those local rules. Okay. So you've kind of gathered your, your rules as far as actually writing the motion, making sure you know substantively what has to be in there, when it has to be done. Uh, but let's talk about scheduling. And this is very much uh, up to the, the local courts. And this is still one of the things that um, you know, makes it very fun to travel to different circuits and get to see the way different courts uh, uh, handle their dockets. Uh, I, I personally still enjoy going to law days in some counties where all of the court's matters are only going to be heard on, you know, the second Tuesday and the fourth Tuesday of the month. Those can be actually pretty pretty entertaining and you get to learn a lot about, uh, you know, fences uh, between neighbors and uh, quit claim deeds and all sorts of great stuff. Um, but uh, it, it's important to know how the courts are going to schedule their dockets. Um, you know, in the city, we, we certainly have a, a very interesting system that uh, it allows for um, anybody to get to trial pretty much any time they want, but it does make for some interesting nuances on, on how the, the motions are heard as opposed to the county uh, without centralized docketing where, where it's uh, tougher to get to trial but perhaps uh, very straightforward on, on how you get your motions heard. So in the city, of course, any motion related to uh, continuances, trial settings, uh, most scheduling orders. You're going to be in Division One with Judge Mullen. But for your more fun motions, uh, summary judgments, motion to compel, etc., uh, those are going to be heard in either the motion or the equity dockets. And uh, well, I shouldn't say or it's the motion slash equity docket. Of course, we have two of those. Um, beginning of the year, we always have to take a look and see who's going to have them. Uh, Judge Moriarty has now been uh, on one of those dockets for quite a while, but the other one is now in Division Six. Judge Stelzer, uh, he's in the Civil Courts Building, and I believe uh, he's got the even number one. Yeah. Odd numbers for still Judge Moriarty, even numbered cases to be in front of Judge Stelzer. I've not been in front of him yet, so uh, at least not on a civil matter. I've had some criminal things in front of him, but, but not civil. So I'm not sure how uh, he's handling exactly uh, uh, the way they are that morning, but I'm sure it would be standard to everybody else. 
Uh, they've now got the automated system. You can go on online, see when they've got their dockets, and, and just take the slots, depending on, on which one you want. But make sure you you uh, show up in the right courtroom. Don't go to Division One for your motions to compel. Uh, some other fun parts that they talked about, there's the link on there. So that's how you actually get to the court's website to have your contested motions heard. They also require, of course, and this is something that you're going to hear throughout the day, um, professionalism, professional courtesy. Uh, one of the things that is so basic, we'll, we'll talk about this, but the city actually now has it written into the rules. You've got to at least check with the other side to try to find a mutually convenient date. I think it's something that most people would expect uh, the other side to do. It's something most of us would do uh, out of respect for the other side. The city actually now mandates it, so you got to got to comply with that. If your motion is going to be one where you're going to uh, put evidence on the record, uh, at least in terms of testimony from a witness, you've got to actually call the court's clerk and schedule it. Because if you show up and expect there to be uh, a court reporter ready to start taking taking down on the record, uh, you'll be sorely mistaken. So you've got to comply with that by contacting the court. Uh, something else that I wanted to mention that I don't think I put in here. Okay, yeah. So this is this is as good a point as any to mention as well. Dispositive motions. It's in your packet, but it's not on a slide. Dispositive motions in the city. There is a local rule that also confirms you have to file them no more than 60 days before trial. So the city actually codifies that in, in a local rule, which is in there. The other part. Uh, Again, city local rules involving minor settlement. So you file your case in the city, or you get sued in the city, you're in circuit court. Um, you know, maybe you see Judge Moriarty more, or Judge Stelzer once or twice, but ultimately end up hammering out a settlement. But it involves a minor, or it involves a wrongful death. Those have to be approved. Uh, the circuit judges don't even hear those. Now they might if you ask them and say, you know, uh, We've already been assigned out to trial to uh, Beth Hogan. Beth, we hear the judge, we hear the trial, so we hear the settlement. Maybe she will. But the rules actually say it gets kicked over to the associate docket for that. And that's divisions 27 and 28. So again, the, the local rules are pretty funky on these things. Um, St. Louis County, way easier. Uh, the number one rule on there is who is the judge's clerk and when does he or she let the judge hear your motion? So if you know who that person is, it will make life a lot easier. Introduce yourself to them, uh, try to have their phone number, and make sure that if you need to schedule something, that's what you go through. The other part, in the county, we're all out there so much these days, it, it seems that uh, you, know, you can clearly poke your head in and ask the clerk for, for dates, and they're usually very good about giving you those. And then the outstate counties are even more fun, as I mentioned. Uh, you know, the, the, they're uh, they're all going to have their own rules. If you are have multiple cases in the same circuit in different counties in that circuit, you'll start figuring out that certain counties are Mondays, the next county is Tuesday, the next county is Wednesday. That's because that's the circuit judge can't be in each of those counties at the same time. So it's uh, you know you, you've got to know the way they do them there. And then ultimately, the most important rules are not codified in, in most of maybe some locals, but call the other side. Try to be, you know, courteous. Let's try to work these things out if we can. If we can't, let's at least make sure we've got a, a hearing that works for all of us. And very importantly, call the clerk. Uh, there have been times, and I'll go with me or the other side, where we're there, we're ready to hear it, and the judge is. And sometimes that's because there was just a miscommunication. You, know, you might file your notice thinking the judge always hears things at 9 o'clock on Thursday, but if, uh, if, if she's down in Jefferson City for you know, judicial college, you, know, you blew it. So call the clerk. Okay, now, the more fun part, of course, is arguing the motion. And uh, here it is. You, you've now got your, uh, your day in court. You're going out to... Uh, see uh, Judge Roy Bean, the law west of the Pecos River. Um, you made sure to find out when his law day was, and it was uh, every 17th Friday. So that's, that's Judge Roy Bean. Okay, 
what do you want to do when you're out there? I mean, some of this stuff is so basic, I hesitate to say it to you folks because I know that you wouldn't be here if you weren't probably already following a lot of these rules. But dress appropriately. You know, when you go into court, uh, you don't want to look like a scrub. You, you want the judge to know that you are serious, that your motion is important, that you're taking it seriously, and that you want the judge to take it seriously. Um, you know, it's a, it's a pet peeve of some judges, and I, I know our next speaker will be able to, to mention this uh, from her own standpoint, that some judges don't like it when you wear overcoats in their courtroom, despite the fact that it might only be 30 degrees. But if you go in uh, and it's raining, it's snowing, you know, unless you are already familiar with the judge's preferences and tolerances, then err on the side of caution and professional. Take off your overcoat, hang it up, sit down, and, 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 and wait for the, the court to come. Um, I think it's important to introduce yourself to the court personnel, uh, the bailiff, the clerk, at least for the first time, you know, that you've ever been in there. And especially if you are in a neck of the woods where you're concerned you might get home cooked, um, you know, the other side is probably going to know everybody because they're there all the time. So it doesn't hurt for you to at least try to uh, 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 get some familiarity with, with the staff. With the judge, once the judge finally does come out, uh, you know, it's, it's just a habit of mine, but even for judges that I've known for 15 years, I will still always say, Tom Neal, I'm here for whatever side party I, I have, because that judge is probably gonna see 30 to 40 to 100 lawyers that day, and why have them sit there you know, racking their brain going, I know I know this guy, what's his name? I mean, you don't want to put them in that office. So say it, um, I, I, I only got a, the opportunity to appear in front of my aunt one time, but I did make sure to tell her, no, that's nephew Tom, okay, I got that. <laughs> you know, all your life. Um, some other basics, uh, you know, I think that it is, it is now fairly acceptable to have your cell phone uh, on in the courtroom before the judge gets out there, at least for checking emails and stuff, but at least don't have a ringer on on it. I mean that it, it, it's it's just so unprofessional. Okay, uh, here's a little video about cell phones. One hundred thousand years ago, a caveman was out hunting on the frozen wastes when he slipped and fell into a crevasse. In 1988, he was discovered by some scientists and thawed out. He then went to law school and became unfrozen caveman lawyer. Did you hear that, Mr. Kirok? Hang on a second. I'm sorry, Your Honor. I was listening to the magic voices coming out of this strange modern invention. <laughs> okay. The late, great Phil Hartman. So awesome. Uh, if you can go on YouTube and find the whole thing, it's so good. Uh, all right, so <coughs> we know we're not supposed to be on our phone when the judge is out there. What, what do we do when we're sitting around waiting? And, and yesterday, I was in, uh, in, in a division in the county uh, that is uh, uh, regularly one where you have lots of free time. And so what do you do while you're out there? Well, for those of you that are billing hourly, uh, you know, I would say that is an opportunity where you can certainly be killing two birds with one stone. Now, how you handle that ethically, that's your problem, but you can at least have two things to do because there's no reason for you to be sitting there not being productive. Now, one of the things, fortunately, again, on, on the docket I was on yesterday uh, was there's a lot of lawyers out there because we're all waiting for, for the same, same relief. And uh, so it's a good chance to catch up and just see who's, who's going out there. I mean, this is your opportunity to start networking with folks you're going to be practicing with for 20 years. And if they see that, you know, Faith is in uh, the courtroom quite regularly, they're going to say, okay, well, yeah, I know she's always out there. And she's got these dockets. And so you start getting a reputation. And it's not a bad one to have as somebody that is in the courtrooms regularly. So see who else is out there. One of the things that's really fun, again, on the law day dockets where you've got, you know, 150 cases that are going to be heard. I love getting there early and flipping through the docket sheet to look for old law school classmates that might be practicing in Poplar Bluff and I haven't seen them in years. I'm like, oh my gosh, so and so is going to be here. So I think that's kind of fun. Um, it might be a little weird to think that's fun, but that, that can be kind of fun. Um, you know, this one's very important. 
if it's the first time that you're in front of a judge, absolutely pay attention to how he or she is handling their motions before you get up there. Uh, if, if you've got a motion to uh, compel production of cell phone records and three hearings before yours is a motion to compel emails, chances are you're going to glean from that judge how he or she is going to be thinking about your case. So see what they're doing. See what they like. Um, you know, a lot of judges, if they have the, the bench that's, that's large out in front of them, or certainly if it's the ones in St. Louis County where it's, it's slightly depressed with a little shelf, you, know, you can put your stuff on, on there. But if it's a small bench and you go and you sit your, your binder up on the judge's desk, you, know, you, you might take that judge off. So you know, it would be nice if you figured that out by watching somebody else make that mistake before you. Um, you know, it, 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 at the very least, you've got your motion there, brush up on it beforehand, but I think it's a great opportunity, uh, again, especially on those bigger dockets, um, to, to get us socialized with, with some colleagues. Again, I, I already mentioned this, introduce yourself to the judge when it's time to argue. Don't put the stuff on the judge's bench unless it's clear that that's acceptable. And by all means, have courtesy copies. Uh, you know, a lot of judges now, I kind of feel like I'm wasting paper doing this because I'll bring them the motion and they will turn and they'll put it up on their computer and they'll pull it up on case. I probably still am going to err on the side of printing those papers for at least a, a, a few more years until I'm relatively confident that every judge is going to be doing that. But I can think of at least one that uh, uh, does not do it that way. And, and so be on the safe side. And also the cases. You know, if you've got two, three cases that are gold, bring them for the court. Um, back to knowing some of the, the, the rules, uh, don't forget, in the city, you get 15 minutes each side. Most of the time, the judges don't even want to give you 15 minutes, but that's actually what you do get. Um, if you run over, some of the judges will just cut you off. Most of them are not quite that mean, but, but do know that. Make sure you're, you're familiar with that rule. Can't stress this enough. Be prepared. You know, uh, we've kind of envisioned this little scenario that I've been discussing this morning as you've been on the, the motion from the get-go. That first slide, you know, your partner says, I want you to handle this from, uh, from beginning to end. Well, it's not always like that. I mean, obviously, if, if, if that's the case, you're going to know your motion backwards and forwards. But let's say it gets dropped on you uh, on a Thursday night. Uh, you might even just get a phone call. Uh, I was supposed to handle this. I'm double booked. I need you to be wherever. Read the motion. Read the other side's motion. Know that stuff very clearly because if you go in there and, and the judge is clear, it's clear to the judge that you don't know what you're talking about, you know, you don't want to lose a motion just on that. That's, oh, this isn't even important. They, they didn't even, it, it, how important could this motion be if this, that they send out a brand new associate who doesn't even know the facts? When you show up there, you want to be the authority. You want the judge like, oh, now I know why they sent this associate out here. This is so, this must be this, this kid's bread and butter. So know it. Uh, I like to make outlines uh, on anything that's that's more than just a, a couple paragraph motion. You know, have your, your bullet points and make sure that you tick those off as, as you're going down the lines. And then just from a, again, kind of a, a courtesy standpoint to the other side, but, but really, again, letting the judge know that, that you are the master of this subject, you know, be polite, take turns. Let the other side make their points, you make your points, and, and that should be it. Uh, they're, they're, you know, certainly in some courts where it's still a little uh, formal, where you're out there and, and the judge says, well, it's your motion, so you take the lead, they get a respond, and then you get a reply. Um, if it's that structured, like an, an appellate type argument, you, know, you can't sandbag and, and leave stuff that some, some gold nuggets for your reply, because all that's going to do is going to tick off the court. They're going to then give the last word to the other side. So you don't want to do that. Um, if you do need to respond, you know, ask the court. Can I, can I just respond to that last bit of very important information that they've now tried to slip into you at the end of their motion? Um, know when you've won. Uh, that's, uh, that, that I, I, I still, uh, this day, I, I love it where uh, it's absolutely clear that, uh, you know, uh, one side has won or lost motion. And the, the winning side has decided that they're just going to have to get that last word in 
And the judges will sometimes say, they'll say, okay, well, if you, if you want to talk me out of ruling in your favor, but go ahead and give me that opportunity. So you need to know when, when you've won. If it's absolutely clear, just don't say anything. And, and just say, Judge, I, I think you've already reached your conclusion and I'm good with it. Also know when you've lost. This is very important. Let's try to stay objective. Objection. Overruled. No, 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 no. No, I strenuously object. Oh, wow. Well, strenuously object, and I should take some time to reconsider. <laughs> because that's never happened. That, that, that just, that you're not going to change their minds at that point. So if you've lost, just live with it and try to make sure that the order is as reasonable to your, your issues as you need to. When it comes to drafting the order, um, you know, I, I typically go with uh, the approach of whoever won should probably draft it. I just lost by my having to write your motion that's, or your order. That's, that's no good. So whoever wins should write it. The other side, though, needs to make sure absolutely that it says what the judge says. If there's no uh, time uh, requirement for the losing party to do whatever it is they're being told to do, Agree to one, you know. Okay, how long do you need? Judge says you got to answer it. I didn't say how long. How long do you need? Ten days, seven days, twenty days. Put something in there. If you can't agree, go back in and ask the judge. Uh, but don't leave court that morning without an order that says what needs to happen. Okay, that all you're doing is asking to go back up there. Um, since I have a few minutes left, I will actually skip ahead. I in the bonus time. A couple thoughts on, on motion practice that uh, folks have asked uh, in years past to try to talk about. Um, one of them certainly is summary judgments. Uh, you can go on to Google and find a fabulous article written by former uh, Circuit Judge Julian Bush, uh, now uh, St. Louis City Councilor uh, Julian Bush, on summary judgments. It, the title is, is a little interesting, it's how to do a summary judgment motion. Um, and it's, it's great. It's outdated uh, in some respects, so I would suggest looking at some great cases that have been coming out of the Southern District lately um, that really uh, show how to refine your summary judgment motion, especially for the, the moving part. Um, I think there's going to be a trend away from this notion that, oh, I've got 100 statements of, of material fact. I think those days are, are very much numbered. And I think if you look at, at those four cases and even some of the newer ones, you're going to find that if you can't get by with five to, to ten facts, then you probably are not, probably should not be winning a motion for summary judgment because there's too many things that are still at issue. Um, so those are the basics for, for your, your motion practice career. Uh, again, if you know the rules, you know the local rules, you're nice to the other side, and you're nice to the clerks, uh, you're going to be very successful at it, um, and I, I certainly wish you guys all the best in your practice.